1st, which is 22 days left before Election Day, the polls are a little confusing. Yesterday, two national surveys told very different tales about the state of the race. One from NBC News and The Wall Street Journal shows Hillary Clinton leading by 11 points amongst likely voters in a four-way contest, 48 to 37 percent over Trump. But another highly respected poll from ABC News and The Washington Post suggests Clinton has only a four-point lead over Trump, 47 to 43. Today, Monmouth University put out its own national survey showing Clinton up 12, and things are no clearer on the state level. Quinnipiac University has a bunch of battleground polling they put out today shows Clinton up eight in Colorado, six in Pennsylvania, four in Florida, and a tied race in Ohio. And but a CNN ORC poll out today shows Trump leading in Ohio by four. CNN has Clinton up with well within the margin of error one in North Carolina, within the margin of error up two in Nevada. Two more polls I want to mention to you. In New Hampshire, a WBR, WBUR survey has Clinton leading by just three percentage points in that state that Trump visited over the weekend. And finally, in Virginia, Clinton has expanded her edge by a massive lead of 15 points, according to the widely respected Christopher Newport University poll that's out today. So, John, it's a lot of polling data. What is the actual state of the race right now? Well, Mark, I'd like to say first on behalf of our friend John Ralston, who we'll be seeing in Nevada uh, when we head out to Las Vegas in the next day or so, that if we, if you do it, I do it, not Nevada, Nevada, Ralston, Ralston's echoing in my ear. The second thing is I'm in Chicago here where I spent most of this day with David Axelrod, and David Axelrod and I have discussed this polling at some length today, and one of the things that he, the point he made that our friend David Pluff has made on other occasions, which is that uh, right now, if you look at all these polls and take them all together, a couple things are clear. One, Hillary Clinton's never been behind in this race. Donald Trump's been behind. He's still behind he nationally and in the battleground states. And if you look at those battleground state polls where there's been less erosion than there has been at the national level since Trump's problems or the worst of his problems began with the release of the Access Hollywood tape, it's still the case that she has she's in a better position in the battleground states right now than Barack Obama ever was in 2012 against Mitt Romney, and we all know how that turned out. Yeah, he was an incumbent uh, and a stronger candidate in a lot of ways. Look, Trump is still the underdog, but if you look at the states he must win in order to get close to 270 electoral votes, th th this national polling is, is catastrophic for him. If he loses by five points nationally, he's not going to win the election. It'll be a landslide. But the state polls, which are from roughly the same period, show that he can win. Take a look at this map. Give him all the Romney states, including North Carolina, a state where he's behind the Trump people concede, but where the national, the state polls are closer. Give him Florida, give him Ohio, give him Iowa, give him the state where Las Vegas is, the name of which I cannot pronounce. Give him those, he's at 265. Now, he still needs to get five more to win. And giving him all those states is just a, a mental exercise. He's, he's probably behind in at least three of them. Maybe a little bit ahead in Ohio yes. and Iowa. But my point is, as dire as things are for Trump right now, if he has a little bit of a role nationally, and if he can win those five states, he'll get to 265 electoral votes, then who knows? He's the underdog. He has been all along. He's had a horrible stretch. But the state polling, where he's doing better with independents and better with women, for the most part, than he's doing nationally, yeah. shows that this thing is not over. Right, but here's the thing. It's it's. You're saying let's do it, that it's a mental exercise to give him all those states. I think it's like a, an exercise of mental gymnastics. I mean, you're saying that he's, he's within striking distance, but behind, in a bunch of states that he has to win all of. It's like he has to, this is like, you're saying he's within striking distance of pulling an inside straight. I mean, if it was just one or two states where he was, there were must-win states for him that he was behind in, I'd see there was like a more of a, of, a, of a plausible path, but we're talking here about a national wave that's moving against him. And in these states where you're right, he hasn't lost at that much altitude. He's still where he was a few weeks ago, which was needing to run an inside straight and, and, and overcome obstacles well, and deficits him, in all him, of those states at take once. Him, yep, take them one by one. Ohio, he's generally been ahead, and the Clinton folks think he could win there. He could win Iowa. You know, I think. The silver state is, is, a, is a question mark, but he's been ahead at times. So then you get out to Florida and North Carolina. He's got huge enthusiasm in Florida. He spent a lot of time there. I don't know that he'll win it, but I think he could. It's down to North Carolina, where he is behind. But when you say, well, he's got to draw well, an inside straight on all five, in three of them, I think he's even or ahead. 
It's, it's not, it's not, but you just, I mean, you just basically said you don't know that he's ahead in Florida. He's behind in almost all the Florida polling. So, you know, I, again, I just, like, there, you're, if you give him everything, no. then you're giving him I'm everything, giving him, and he's still at 265. Yeah, you give him the so, three, give him for yeah. a mental exercise the three where he's even or ahead. Then he's got to find a way to win Florida and North Carolina. And then the last five's really tough. And he's still at 265. Yeah, right? that's why he's deeply the right. underdog in this race. All right, we agree then on that for sure. Donald J. Trump has, for a while now, been doubling and tripling down, and even quadrupling down sometimes on his whole, the election is rigged refrain, even as his running mate Mike Pence said on the Sunday shows this weekend that the Republican ticket would honor the will of the voters, even if Hillary Clinton wins. Uh, today, Trump was added again, tweeting, quote, of course there is large scale voter fraud happening on and before Election Day. Why do Republican leaders deny what is going on so naive? To which Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, Robbie Mook, responded this way on a conference call with reporters. He said, quote, Donald Trump's campaign is spiraling. He's desperately trying to shift attention from his own disastrous campaign. He knows he's losing and he's trying to blame that on the system. This is what losers do, and we're not going to even give it any credit by amplifying it. It's not true. The system is not rigged. Mark, uh, the conventional wisdom is that Trump has been laying the groundwork here with a bunch of excuses in case he loses so he can kind of justify his failure. But do you think in the short term, i.e. pre-election, and in the medium to long term, i.e. post-election, do you think there are other objectives that he's pursuing by advancing this line of argument? I think he's mostly doing it out of immaturity and, 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 and like impulsiveness and because he's surrounded by a bunch of people who believe in conspiracy theories. I actually think it's more that. And it's not achieving a short-term objective because it's crowding out news. Everybody's, the press is going to focus on it. He's going to fight with Republicans and Democrats about it. And if Trump has a chance to win, and he doesn't have a very good chance right now, it's if he's talking about change, if he's talking about Washington needing to be shaken up. So I think it's, I don't think it's, I don't think he's laying the groundwork as much as he's just impulsive and he likes to, you know, prattle on. But I think it's, I think it's for his own chances, it's ridiculously stupid. Well, I think it's also, look, this is incredibly dangerous, the stuff he's saying. Oh, right that now. too. And it's, it, A, it's ridiculous. A, it's ridiculous. I mean, there has been a fair amount of study on the question of voter fraud over the course of uh, the last few years. We've had debates in state after state after voter, voter ID laws, and there have been a minuscule, minuscule, de minimis number of ca ca proven cases of voter fraud before or on Election Day. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think it seems like they're what they're trying to do, and we've said this before, they're trying to depress turnout in general and then rile up the, Repu the, the Trump base to turn out. And maybe they think that's the way to win. So maybe this is part of that trying to rile up the base uh, to kind of say, look, if you don't get out there and vote for us, they're going to steal the election. That's the only way we can fight back. And I think the longer term thing, in addition to making excuses for if he loses, the longer term thing is to try to build some kind of movement. I don't know if that's going to be a business or what, but some kind of uh, anti-Hillary Clinton movement after she gets elected president, if she gets elected president, that he can somehow capitalize on in terms of either power or money. Be fascinating to see in the final 20 plus days how many of the days Trump actually talks about things that will help him get elected versus not. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, up next, why the State Department and the FBI released statements today about Hillary Clinton's emails. We're going to talk about that story when we come right back.
The conservative political world is up in arms today over the release of new FBI documents about the agency's investigation into Hillary Clinton's email practices as Secretary of State. The new disclosures indicate that a State Department official, under Secretary Patrick Kennedy, last year urged the FBI to downgrade the classification of one of Clinton's emails. Investigators wrote that Kennedy made his email request to an FBI agent, who in turn asked about getting the agency more office space overseas, leading to accusations of a possible quid pro quo. It is ambiguous at this hour about who brought up the idea and what that quid pro quo might have been, whether it was suggested, who might have suggested, who didn't. We also know, we do know that Kennedy's request was rebuffed. No classification changes were made. Still, Republicans are seizing on this entire story. Donald Trump has been tweeting about it all day, and his campaign called for Kennedy's resignation this afternoon. House Speaker Paul Ryan put out a statement of his own on the matter, saying the situation, quote, bears all the signs of a cover-up. Mark, what do you make of this, and where might it go? Well, once again, I'll be a critic of the FBI. They should not be putting this stuff out. But having decided to put it out, they need to put it out with real transparency. There's so many redactions in this. I understand why there's suspicion, and I don't blame the Republicans politically or substantively for demanding more information. We simply don't know enough. You, it is not the role of the media or of the Republicans to give the benefit of the doubt to people in government. It's just not. And, and while some of the initial reports of this have overstated what we know and how definitively a, a State Department official might have been involved in the discussions about a quid pro quo, there are a lot of questions begged. And the FBI, I don't know what they're thinking. They're releasing these documents on an ad hoc basis with heavy redactions, only leading to more confusion, right. not clarification, and not public accountability. Right. I, I agree with you. I think, you know, you, you, we've differed about various things on these topics over the last months, but I think the FBI, if you look at the totality of how they've handled disclosures and talking about this case <clears throat> for months now, it's been less helpful rather than more helpful and more confusing rather than clarifying. Um, look, the Clinton campaign, we should say, um, has, is on the record today saying that this was Patrick Kennedy's uh, re request was just part of the normal interagency haggling over classification uh, that takes place. Um, I think it's you know, strange uh, that it would have been, I, I don't think it's, this should be regarded as just customary, given the fact that it was happening after this had become a matter of great public controversy. So there are suspicions here. I think we should pursue them and try to figure it out. Uh, there, there may be more smoke here than fire, but there may also be fire here. And I think the story is going to linger for some days until we get answers to some of the questions that you and I have both raised here today. And Republicans in this case should not be accused of being political, asking for more information. Although Trump and others have gone too far based on what we know. But it is a real issue and it should be investigated. And Republicans are going to talk a lot Agreed. about it for sure. All right, there's another headache they're having in Clinton world. It has to do with the slow drip of Wiki, WikiLeak revelations that keep coming from John Podesta's inbox. Those emails, which allegedly are authentic, at least in some cases they seem to be, started dropping about a week ago, starting out with some excerpts from Clinton's Wall Street speeches. The alleged communiques then went through a series of daily disclosures, mostly involving what would be considered campaign gossip or insider stuff, including one in which a longtime Clinton aide, Doug Ban, referred to Chelsea Clinton as a spoiled brat. The disclosures continued all last week and into the weekend. There was one email which Republicans have seized on that seemed to the staff level mock evangelicals and conservative Catholics that came from Jennifer Palmieri, this communications director. There was one purportedly showing Clinton allies polling on President Obama's ties to the Muslim faith and his past drug use back during the 2008 campaign. Then, over the last couple of days, came the release of what for a long time was considered the anti-Clinton holy grail, the transcripts of her three paid speeches to Goldman Sachs. That came out, and again, interesting stuff, but no game-changing revelations. So, John, a lot of interesting disclosures, some that speak to the culture of the Clinton campaign, but no mega bombshell so far. So where does that leave the current damage and potential threat of what we expect to be a continued drumbeat of disclosures? Right. I mean, I agree these things are, are a lot of them are really interesting and some of them are quite damning, um, not in ways that are surprising to, to me and you. And again, I'll say, talking to David Axelrod about this today for my podcast, uh, uh, The Culture Caucus, we had this conversation. He basically said that, you know, some of these things were uh, that, were, that were, were revealing about Clinton's campaign culture, and that, that, but they weren't things. He had a very dyspeptic view in 2008, for instance, about what Clinton's campaign culture was like, and he now sees it kind of laid bare. But I think, like, the, the, ones, that, the ones to me that are most dangerous 
are the ones that touch on President Obama. And I find it still incredibly intriguing, the notion that he had a, an email account that he emailed under an alias, and now it seems to be suggested that he may have been in communication with Hillary Clinton under that email. There's a lot of things that go, the things that touch directly on President Obama, Hillary Clinton, and the email contract potentially damaging, potentially. I think that the press has kind of now accepted the narrative that these emails in their totality show an in, a window into the kind of culture of a Clinton operation that says one thing and does another. That's not unusual for political right. operations, but I think that has, has kind of primed the pump. And I think people also now recognize that it's possible that whoever's controlling the, the nature of this disclosure did not necessarily lead with the lead. And so while you could imagine after days of these, the media's posture would be, well, we've seen all this, let's not look. I think people are primed for a big disclosure, and that will help uh, if something comes up that actually is worth it. But for the most part, this has you know, lowered people's expectations about what might come. All right, taking a break now. Up next, the great Phil Rucker of The Washington Post has a great story. The title is Donald Trump's Echo Chamber of Conspiracies, Grievances, and Vitriol. That's quite a headline. We'll be right back to talk to Phil about that right after this. Welcome back. Lots going on politically today. Joining us now to talk about it all from our nation's capital, Phil Rucker, national political reporter for The Washington Post. So, Phil, you and Bob Costa had a great story looking at Donald Trump's actions over the last couple of days and what they mean. Just do you think he's in a different place now in terms of his rhetoric and his and his mental state than he's been? I do. I mean, I think he's been moving in this direction for some time, uh, but he's very clearly deciding to turn inward and, and really speak directly to his base uh, and to talk a lot about dark conspiracies and uh, air his grievances. And he's veering away from the core messages that animated his campaign early on and that a lot of Republicans believe could give him a better chance to win the election and focusing instead on things like the polls are rigged and, and, not, and corrupt and that the media is by and part of this global conspiracy and even saying, uh, as he repeated again today, that the election uh, is going to be rigged and stolen and that the voter fraud is happening and, and rampant and, and cheating is underway. So it, it's a pretty dark turn. So let me ask you what you know about this. My reporting is that some of his advisors think this stuff's great. 
they like it intellectually right. and they think it, they think it will help win a base election. But he's got other advisors who are saying you should be talking about the economy, change, Hillary Clinton as being part of the problem. Are, are there divisions and, and why is Trump not listening to the people who are arguing for the latter message? I think there are, and a lot of uh, sort of traditional Republican strategists and operatives are deeply uncomfortable uh, with the rhetorical direction that Trump is taking, but he's getting a lot of his cues from Steve Bannon, uh, who is the chief executive of the campaign. He used to run the Breitbart uh, website, Stephen Miller, his policy director and speechwriter as well. Uh, they're helping feed a lot of this to Trump. They're with him every day, helping him craft his message on the stump. That speech in Florida on Thursday night was really, I think, a turning point here where he went full on with the global conspiracy and talked about the Clinton campaign, the media, the banks, multinational corporations, foreign governments, all colluding in very dark ways to undermine this election and steal it from him and his movement. Phil, just explain what the theory of the case is, of like how this helps him win. I mean, it, it, obviously it appeals to his base, or at least a, yeah. a subset of his base, but just for those who are urging this on him, presumably they're urging him on this path because they think it's the way to win. So in their world, how do they explain how this is a path to victory? I think there are two pieces. Uh, first of all, it's his base. It, 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 he's saying things that he thinks are going to uh, galvanize, motivate, energize this base of aggrieved uh, white people, many of them working class. Uh, there's a belief in the Trump campaign that there are more of these people out there prepared to vote for Donald Trump than our polls are indicating, and the people who have not participated in elections before. So he's trying to motivate them, to give them a reason to turn out. The other piece is he's trying to uh, suppress Hillary Clinton's base and give, uh, give voters who might be going to the polls for Hillary Clinton a reason to think twice or maybe feel uncomfortable about doing so or feel like something's wrong with the process or there's going to be uh, too much uh, friction or tension at the polling places. Uh, I was talking to uh, Mayor Michael Nutter the former mayor of Philadelphia today, and he said this is his big fear in Philadelphia, that the, the Trump campaign, Trump himself talking about voter fraud and, and urging his supporters to go to the polling places uh, could be an intimidating force uh, and suppress the African-American vote in that city, which of course would help Donald Trump. Phil, I just want to ask you about, about InfoWars. Just for the benefit of anybody who's yeah. not familiar with Alex Jones and InfoWars, we've seen Trump both retweeting things from editors at, at InfoWars. We saw him talking about the theory that Hillary Clinton was on drugs at the last debate, which is kind of straight out of the InfoWars uh, world and Alex Jones. Just tell people what is InfoWars and, Info and Alex Jones, and why is Donald Trump talking, taking pages out of their playbook? Well, it's a website. Uh, it's really one of the darkest corners of the, the media online, if you want to call it that. They don't do traditional journalism, but they, they spread a lot of theories, and uh, in, including 9-11 truther theories. This, this is a, a website that was home to a lot of ideas after 9-11, that it was somehow a tyrannical sort of government plot, uh, the terrorist attacks of 20, uh, 2001, rather. Alex Jones is, is somebody that Trump uh, has done interviews with. Uh, he certainly listens to what he has to say. And it's also a place where Roger Stone, a longtime Trump uh, advisor, f frequently appears and, and peddles ideas. And, and a lot of the uh, conspiracies that you hear Trump bringing up on the campaign trail, like Hillary Clinton's drug use, uh, which, by the way, there's no evidence of that, uh, originated with InfoWars, the site. So it's like Breitbart, uh, probably lesser known to the mainstream public, but uh, it's one of those sites online. And Phil, do you know anything about how that conveyor belt works? In other words, is, is Trump reading this stuff himself or people pitching it to him and saying, hey, you should talk about this? How does, how does it go from InfoWars saying Hillary Clinton is a drug problem to Trump saying it on the stump? I, I wish I knew all, <laughs> all of the steps there, but it, it, it started at InfoWars with Roger Stone uh, advancing the theory uh, in an interview with, with Alex Jones on InfoWars, and then all of a sudden it came out of Trump's mouth uh, over the weekend at that rally in New Hampshire. So uh, somehow or another, Trump is getting this information in front of him. I don't know if it's Stephen Bannon, his chief executive for the campaign, or somebody else, but, but there's some conduit here. It'd be fascinating to know whether people are actually pitching to him that he use it or simply showing it to him and then he's using it himself and of course particularly with the debate coming up all campaigns worry that if you say something in front of the candidate or to the candidate he or she may well just blurt it out on the stump he had a teleprompter at that speech i wonder if that was in the prompter or that was an ad lib because <laughs> it was not necessarily it, it would... something everybody on the campaign wanted to have him say 
Yeah, it'd be really striking if that was in the prompter, but he said it, so he, he has to live by it. Yeah, so we do have the debate coming up on, on Wednesday. Any sense of That's right. if the Trump campaign thinks that this is their last best hope of cutting into Hillary's lead, or they, they don't, they're not building it up that way? Well, uh, it, it is her, it is his last best hope. It's the last chance he's going to have to talk to, uh, you know, 60, 80, 100 million people in the country directly with Clinton. Uh, he prepared for it over the weekend, uh, Sunday at Bedminster with some of his advisors, uh, but he's clearly not putting in the time that Hillary Clinton is. She's taken uh, two full days, three, three days rather, off the campaign trail uh, and is in New York doing debate prep, and, and Trump is going to be doing some rallies instead. Uh, so we'll see if he comes in prepared. I'm also looking... To to see if he'll have a stunt like he did last time right before the debate. Right. Phil Rucker, thanks very much. Take a break. We come back. We're going to talk more about some late-breaking developments out on TV World on the campaign trail right after this. I said to my husband that, you know, the language is inappropriate, it's not acceptable. And um, I was surprised because that is not the man that I know. The cameras were not on, it was only a mic. And I wonder um, if they even knew that the mic was on because they, they were kind of a, a boy talk and uh, he was lead on, like uh, egg on, from uh, the host to say um, dirty and bad stuff. You, you feel the host, Billy Bush, was sort of egging him on? Yes. Yes. Is that language you had heard him use before? No. No, that's why I was surprised, uh, because I said, like, I don't know that person that would talk that way and uh, that he would say that kind of a stuff in private. I heard many different stuff, uh, boys talk. I, uh, the boys, the, the way they talk when they grow up and they wanna um, uh, sometimes show each other, oh, this and that, and talking about the girls. And, but um, uh, yeah, I, w I was surprised, of course. That was just a part of Melania Trump's interview with CNN's Anderson Cooper, which airs in full later today. And he's done an interview. She's done an interview also with Fox that will air tomorrow. Joining us now to talk about everything that's going on, former Republican congressman, the gentleman from Georgia, Jack Kingston. He is a Trump campaign advisor. And Tracy Seffel, a Democrat communications consultant who is now a senior advisor to the Democratic National Committee. Both are here. 
Thank you both for joining us. Congressman, is, is the political fallout from the Access Hollywood tape and Donald Trump's accusers an ongoing story or is it done? You know, I think it depends on how we handle it. Um, I was listening to a lawyer the other day uh, who was saying that, y you know, you have to disprove these cases, but you don't have to litigate them. In other words, if you, uh, one witness, for example, said, I was sitting in the airplane across from this one, it went, it went on, or, and nothing went on. Um, you know, another case, a family member has come out and says, well, you know, my cousin just loved Donald Trump until he turned her down to come to her restaurant. Um, an, another one is saying she doesn't really remember where it took place or when it took place. Um, I, I think that Donald Trump has to defend himself but not dwell on it. I think it's very important to acknowledge it. These are very serious charges. This is a serious um, allegation. But at the same time, I think he needs to say, you know, I've dealt with it. But I want to talk about changing the culture in Washington, D.C. I want to talk about this economy. I want to talk about 94 million people who are underemployed or unemployed in America. I want to talk about our, our weakening position abroad and how we're not doing well in the Middle East. And, and I think that if he talks about changing the Washington culture and the issues of the economy and national security, that's what people are looking for in the next president. And I think that he can move beyond these. Your candidate and your party have largely stayed away from this, not putting out press releases or fanning it very much. The press interest in it has waned over the weekend a little bit. Is this something the Democratic Party should or will talk more about to try to bring back the accusations and how Donald Trump has handled them and the Access Hollywood tape? Well, the congressman offers some good advice to his candidate and from his lips to Donald's tweets. We'll see. He doesn't seem to be taking that advice. But where I come into this whole issue is that he's just engaging in victim blaming, and it's really pretty heinous. What we're seeing is more and more people over the weekend when press interest was waning, actually you were seeing advocacy groups who help victims and survivors of sexual assault their calls were going through the roof. There was incredible increases. People are saying, wait a minute, this sounds very similar to an experience of mine, and I want to come forward and talk to someone about that. That's what he's essentially, he's, he's had this eruption of concerns and victims who are seeking support. And that is perhaps the only single positive thing to come from this, is that there are people now seeking support. Everything else that comes out of his mouth, and from what it sounds like, even coming out of his wife's mouth, to me, it's victim blaming. Okay. I want to try to get to two more stories in our limited time. So very quickly, let's play you a new videotape from Donald Trump talking about this controversy involving the State Department and the FBI. This is very big, and frankly, it's unbelievable. What was just found out is that the Department of Justice, the State Department, and the FBI colluded, got together, to make Hillary Clinton look less guilty and look a lot better than she looks. This is one of the big breaking stories of our time, in my opinion. This shows corruption at the highest level. And we can't let it happen as American citizens. This is complicated. I tried to, we tried to explain it early in the show, but, but, but let me ask you one question that's simple. Patrick Kennedy, the State Department, is the official at the center of this, according to the FBI. He has been a defender, de facto defender of Hillary Clinton. Would you like to see Patrick Kennedy go up to Capitol and explain himself and clear the air? I'll give you one simple answer, which is the FBI has said this is all ridiculous. Completely no, they didn't say it was ridiculous. They said it wasn't indictable. Completely misconstrued. Would you like to see Patrick Kennedy on Capitol Hill what, explaining himself? You know what I would like and a whole bunch of other people would like? To talk about the very things that are going to drive them to the booths on election day or to pick up the ballots for early voting. It's not this. It's simply not. This is uh, yet another sort of shade game that Trump continues to play. And meanwhile, around the country, you have people saying, well, what about equal pay? What about reforming criminal justice systems? You know the, the list of issues that voters do care about. This isn't on it. Well, Ozzy, one more time. Yes or no, would you like to see Patrick Kennedy speak in public and explain himself? Yes or no? I don't think I'm that interested in okay. it. Okay. Congressman, um, there's only a, a couple weeks before the election. This is a complicated story. Is this something Donald Trump should be emphasizing? To break through to I, voters? I, 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 think, I think it's important because it underscores the corruption of the Clinton family, the Clinton culture, if you will, the pay-for-play culture, the, the one where somebody says, I only have one server and it turns out to be 13, the one that well, but, says... But based on the um, facts of what we know so far about this, what does this have to do with pay-to-play? 
Uh, well, it just underscores. It just fits in with their, the Clinton uh, modus operandi. But uh, here's here's what, what we're learning. And by the way, as you know, this doesn't come from WikiLeaks. This comes from Freedom of Information um, Act. Uh, right. And so here's what we know is that the uh, Patrick Kennedy and the Clinton the State Department goes to the FBI and begs and pleads and cajoles trying to get something declassified or classified to a point where they can hide it in the archives of the State Department basement, never to be seen by the public, and the FBI won't play ball with them. They, they um, I, I guess, started to negotiate to get more slots overseas. It's a little complicated, right, but is. you know, as somebody who was in government, I can tell you, this is not how I want tax-funded entities to act. Right. All right. We're complicated. Thank you both. Congressman, stay right there. We're going to take a break, continue this conversation in just a moment. If you're watching the program in Washington, D.C., you can listen to us whenever you're in the nation's capital on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back. Believe me, she would not be my first choice, that I can tell you. Kellyanne, do you condone that kind of language? Is that the right response? Uh, it's not how I would answer the question. At the same time, um, he's very frustrated because he's denied these allegations. He simply said he didn't do it. Aren't you concerned that he has essentially uh, laid out the map for sexually assaulting women and then you have these women coming forward and saying, yeah, that's what he did? I'm concerned that you're obsessed with covering this point when, again, we have all these issues that Americans tell the NBC pollsters. You want to quote the NBC Washington, uh, uh, Wall Street Journal poll, Kristen? What about the issue sets that's in there? That was Trump campaign manager Kellyanne Conway earlier on Meet the Press Daily. We are back with Jack Kingston, a former U.S. congressman from Georgia and Trump senior advisor. And now here joining me in Chicago is Hari Savugan, the former senior spokesman for Barack Obama's campaigns passed um, back in 2008 and in, uh, did some work at the DNC in 2012, if I remember Correct. correctly. Yep. Um, Hari, I'm going to start with you since you're sitting here with me. Sure. So uh, Kellyanne Conway on Meet the Press Daily also said something about this argument that Trump has been making about it being a rigged election. Yep. She said that absent evidence of wrongdoing, of irregularities in voter fraud, of yeah. course, will accept the outcome. Yeah. If that's her posture, I, that's, I think, the yeah. posture of almost every campaign. If there's no evidence of wrongdoing or voter fraud, mm -hmm. we accept the outcome. If that's what she's saying is their stance, why is Donald Trump 
saying the opposite, saying, of course, there's already voter fraud happening right now, and it happens all the time. You're naive to believe otherwise. Well, the posture of every campaign is what the candidate says, and the candidate says that there's going to be a rigged election. And what I think is important here is that it, he, Donald Trump has shown over the last couple of weeks that he's not really interested in winning this election. This talk about rigging an election is not about actually winning. It's about setting him up for what he wants to do afterwards, which is keep this constituency that he's built for some other business venture, and I think it's going to be Trump TV. But everything he's done, whether it is, you know, this talk about rigging an election actually depresses his own vote. That's what I don't understand. Like, if you look at the Washington Post poll, his voter enthusiasm numbers went from 91% to the mid-70s in the last couple of weeks when he's really been talking about uh, rigging elections. Right. So he's not interested in winning. This is for something else. Right. Congressman Kingston, I want to ask you uh, about this. Um, there are two things. One is uh, the fact Donald Trump's been making this argument with increasing vociferousness. He's saying that you're naive if you don't think that voter fraud is widespread. As you, I'm sure, know, there's almost no evidence of any voter fraud that's ever happened in recorded American history, uh, at least in recent vintage. It's also the case that we now have stories coming out in which Trump supporters are saying if Hillary Clinton gets elected, it's obviously going to be a rigged outcome, and that they're talking about things like assassination and coups. There was a story in the Boston Globe about that this weekend. So tell me how you think it's possibly justifiable or healthy for our country for Donald Trump to be saying the things he's saying about a rigged election. Well, let me say this. I've been on the ballot 15 different times over a 30-year period of time. I always had campaign poll watchers. It's just a matter of trust but verify. So I believe if you're a Democrat or a Republican, um, sometimes there's irregularities that have nothing to do with party or uh, motive. It's just uh, plain incompetency. So I think it's very important, particularly in tough areas, for each candidate to have poll watchers. And, and I, I, I think that that's the, a, a good direction to to go in. Um, I don't know of anybody Congress of any credibility who says that they think they should assassinate Hillary Clinton if she wins, John. Um, I mean, there's always outliers who say all kinds of wacky things, but they're, they're no one that's uh, affiliated with our campaign. Congressman, excuse me, that's not, but, but Mr. Trump's not, he's going well beyond saying there should be poll watchers, although even that's dubious in my mind. He's saying this is going to be a rigged election, widespread voter fraud is taking place. He tweeted that just today, and I know that they're not campaign officials who are saying this. I'm saying he's creating a climate among a lot of his supporters that's dangerous. What do you say to that? I, I, I think that's ridiculous, John. We hear this from the left. No matter what he says, well, that's dangerous. Who, whose campaign office has been firebombed? It's the Trump office. And, and I would not say that was under any mandate of Hillary Clinton, but was there something in her rhetoric? No, you never hear the press say that. It just, you know, if they burned down the North Carolina campaign office, nobody ever would link that to anything Hillary or any of her subordinates have said. But whatever happens on the Trump campaign, it's always directly related to his last speech. And, and, and I'll say this, in my um, understanding of his definition of rig, is the fact that there is an overwhelming bias against him, whether it's coming out of Hollywood, whether it's coming out of the establishment, whether it comes out of Wall Street, whether it comes out of the media, there does seem to be a fix against Donald Trump. And, um, you know, just this morning I was looking, and I know the numbers have actually changed since then, but 37 daily papers have given endorsement. 23 of those have gone to Hillary Clinton. Six have gone to Johnson. And zero, as of uh, two days ago, went to Trump. I think he picked up one this morning. So, you know, when you, you think about those numbers, it's hard to believe, well, there's no bias whatsoever. Um, you know, to, to me, Con as... Con Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. I'm, I don't mean to ramble. Sorry. I'll just, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just point out that many of those newspapers that you're talking about that have endorsed Hillary Clinton or not endorsed Donald Trump have been newspapers that have never not endorsed a Republican for decades. So they're not exactly liberal newspapers that have gone I'm in that direction. I'm not saying they're liberal. I do I'm, want to ask he, Carly he's this. saying that the system is stacked well, against him, and I think that does prove it. I never mentioned conservative or, or liberal on that. I'm just right. saying um, that Carly, there's possible this bias right now. if you look at that number. Con well, Congressman, again, that's a, that's a weird definition of bias when a conservative newspaper rule that have always endorsed Republicans go against Donald Trump. Well, that's well let me give you the bias definition, that they John. Came to John, it, the, it, it they, is they bias to a, if you're they for came to the a, other Congressman, team. Congressman, I got I to go to my other, I got to go to my other guest here. I got to go to my other guest. I can't just talk to you the entire time. Hari, let me ask you this question. You look at the polls that are out right now. Yep. Why is this rate, I mean, the, she is clearly the leader. She's winning yep. uh, nationally by, by somewhere between four and 11 points, if you yep. take the, the national polls. She's got leads. Some of them are narrow yep. in most of the battleground states. 
Given everything that's happened to Donald Trump in the last two weeks, why is this race still as close as it is? There is still a path for Trump to win, I think you'd agree. Well, listen, I, I think he's got a floor and I think he's got a ceiling and he's going to fluctuate in between those two things. He's not going to, this is not going to be an 80 20 election ever. You know, it's going to be, he's going to be somewhere between 30 and 40, 45 percent. Right. That's where he's going to be. There's definitely movement towards Hillary, but the point is the math is still the math. The path for him to get to 270 is virtually impossible. If she wins every single state and the District of Columbia, there are 19 of them that Democrats have won in the last six elections, right. she starts at 242, right. right? And now we're putting into play Georgia, Utah, Arizona, Texas. Right. They're going on TV. The Hillary Clinton campaign is going on TV in Texas. So, let me ask you about, so they are, they are doing that. Let me ask you this question. Barack Obama's campaign in 2012 mm -hmm. thought about putting Arizona in play. Mm -hmm. got, the, the campaign decided not to do that because yep. they didn't need it. That was their, their judgment. Sure. Don't waste resources. We don't need this. We can get to 270 without it. Yeah. The Clinton campaign is now facing that same choice. Do you yeah. think it's smart for them to expend resources yeah. on reach states yeah. rather than just devoting resources to the states yeah. they absolutely need to win? Look, I think they're going to have the resources they need need for to get to 270 there's definitely going to be that there are going to be expansion states where they're going to try to get votes and it's not only just getting votes for them they're helping their down ballot uh, ticket mates as well in those states and that's going to help Hillary Clinton govern if she's going to pick up Senate seats she's going to pick up House seats but it's also forcing Republicans to play defense there the bottom line is Donald Trump needs to be expanding the map right now right. his map is shrinking all right uh, Harris Vugan Jack Kingston Thank you both for being on the show, especially Jack Kingston, Kingston for doing double duty against both Mark and me. Coming up, we have Captain Mark Kelly on the show right after this quick break. by Captain Mark Kelly. He's the co-founder of America's for Responsible Solutions, the husband, of course, of former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, and he is a retired NASA astronaut like most of us are. Captain, thanks for joining us. The, the Republicans still talk about the Second Amendment. Donald Trump puts it, talks more about guns in his speech generally than Hillary Clinton does. Are you on the side of the voters, you think, at this point, or both sides have their adherence? Well, Gabby and I are both gun owners. You know, I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. On a lot of this stuff, 90% of the voters are with us. I mean, when you look at issues about background checks and domestic violence legislation, I mean, that resonates with people. Right. And so why, why, why do you think Republicans are still talking about it? Are they making a mistake? Well, I think, he's talk, I think he's talking to his base, uh -huh. you know, his base who, and, and, and if you stay away from actually explaining what the specifics are of the policy you are talking about, 
You know, that sounds, when you, when you mention things, the, the control word, gun control, people don't like to be controlled. So if you talk about things in those terms, that resonates with, with his base. However, if, you know, you want to talk sensible, sensibly about the issue, you talk about background check legislation, domestic violence, 90% right. of Americans support You've that. been traveling around by bus and otherwise and, and talking to a lot of people doing events. Give me a state or a race where you think your positions on gun safety is sort of breaking through and could actually impact the outcome. So the New Hampshire Senate race, mm -hmm. Governor Kelly Hassan against, against Kelly, Governor Hassan. Yep. Kelly Ayotte. We went up on TV really early in this race, right? And we spent a lot of money there. And we, we, did an, we did an ad about background checks, about how Senator Kelly Ayotte does not support background checks for, for gun sales. She voted against the Manchin-Toomey bill. A day after we went up on, on TV, she went up with an ad that said she actually supports background checks and did vote on it. Now, she voted for a bill that said background checks in it that was supported by the gun lobby. It did not expand background checks for gun sales. So when you, when you look at that race, I mean, if, if you would have went back just two years ago, would a Republican U.S. Senator from New Hampshire in her campaign ads that she's paying for say, would, would that person say she was supporting background checks for gun sales? Absolutely not. So we've come a long way on this issue. And that's true in, in, in other races as well. Mark, let me ask you this question about, about the state of how things are being, how this issue is being discussed at the presidential level. You have, you know, Donald Trump, Donald Trump making a, some fairly uh, dramatic claims about what Hillary Clinton would do if she became president in terms of gun rights. It seems like, at least among some number of gun owners, there's a lot of panic going on about what will happen if she becomes president. You're seeing some gun manufacturers doing pre-Hillary Clinton election sales on semi-automatic weapons and so on. Do you think that the tenor of the presidential campaign will make it harder to advance common sense gun solutions in your, the views, the ones that you think are common sense, after election day or after Hillary Clinton takes office if she's president? Well, you know, I, I don't want to go down the path that if Hillary did not get elected president, but, but speaking to uh, Hillary being elected and becoming president on January 20th, you know, she's committed to doing something on this issue. She has a record and policy positions, and she wants to, you know, expand background checks. She needs the Congress to do that. She wants to pass domestic violence legislation. And keep in mind about, you know, gun sales, the gun lobby is going to look for pretty much every opportunity uh, to sell firearms. And I don't, I don't have a problem with that as long as they're selling the firearms to responsible people. I'm a gun owner myself. I own six guns. If you sell a gun with a background check and you're not selling it to a felon or a domestic abuser, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you're giving people jobs, you know, largely in, in Connecticut and, you know, other you know, other places. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're hopeful that uh, we're going to continue to move this in, the, in a positive direction. Got just less than a minute left. If Hillary Clinton wins, if Paul Ryan remains Speaker of the House, she's been pretty specific about the kind of gun safety measures she'd like to see. What would you say to Paul Ryan about whether he should let those things get through the House? Well, I would say, let, well, let, let's have a vote. You know, let, let, let these measures get to the floor of the House of Representatives so members of Congress can vote on them. And we'll see what happens then. Mark Kelly, thank you. Good to thank see you. you. Thank you, Mark. We'll be right back.
John, we're both headed to Las Vegas in the next 24 hours to get ready for the big bait. What are yeah. your plans for Las Vegas? Uh, high stakes poker, lots of alcohol, and uh, I don't know. That's pretty much it. How about you? Uh, I'm going to look forward to the debate because I'll be there to work. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. I'll do that too. Yeah. All of our coverage of the debate leading up to Wednesday's big showdown is available now and through the next 28, 24 hours, 48 hours on BloombergPolitics.com. We'll have coverage Wednesday night. And of course, our partnership with Twitter will continue pregame, postgame, the debate itself. Look forward to that. Follow our handle at bpolitics.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Sayonara. I'm Nina Melendez and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with your Bloomberg First Word News. With the U.S. election just weeks away, Hillary Clinton is widening her lead. A Monmouth University poll finds Clinton leading Donald Trump 50 to 38 percent among likely voters. That's up from a 46 to 42 percent lead three weeks ago. The latest Quinnipiac University poll also has Clinton leading in the battleground states of Florida and Pennsylvania. The offensive to retake Mosul is officially underway. The key Iraqi city has been occupied by the Islamic State group since 2014. The campaign began with U.S.-led coalition airstrikes and heavy bombardments on villages. More than 25,000 troops are involved. Kurdish fighters led the initial ground assault. Meanwhile, dramatic images from a Kurdish TV channel underscore the apparent determination of the militant group to hold on to the city. Video footage shows what appears to be a suicide vehicle ram into an Iraqi tank and explode. And in Haiti, authorities say the amount of food and medical aid being delivered to areas hard hit by Hurricane Matthew is increasing. But they are also reporting a rise in the number of cholera victims since the storm. More than 500 people have been confirmed dead. Global news, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nina Melendez. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology is next. Technology. Coming up, it's prime time for Netflix shares in the streaming site surging on strong subscriber growth this quarter. We will break down the numbers. Plus, at IBM, profit margins shrink again. Big Blue trying hard to turn itself around, but there are more challenges ahead for the shift to the cloud. And Project Titan on the rocks as Apple seriously scales back its plans for a car. We'll bring you the latest. First to our lead. 
Netflix shares surging 20% in extended trading on better than expected subscriber growth. The company reported it added 3.6 million subscribers, subscribers in its third quarter. Hit series like Stranger Things and Narcos are credited for helping retain customers. Netflix will continue to turn out new content, saying it will produce 1,000 hours of original programming next year. That is up from 600 hours this year. Also encouraging investors, the forecast for fourth quarter subscriber growth exceeding previous projections. Here with me to break it all down, Greg Porto, lead partner at AT Kearney and in New York, David Kirkpatrick, CEO, CEO of Techonomy and our Bloomberg contributing editor, as well as Lucas Shaw, our Bloomberg news reporter who covers Netflix. Uh, look, uh, Greg, I want to start with you because this is a stock that has been extremely volatile. In fact, when he got off the call at the end of last quarter, Reed Hastings apologized for the volatility. So today we're seeing the kind of volatility you want to see, but still it's unexpected. What's your take on the good and the bad in today's results? Well, there's probably two key drivers of that. One is it's a stock that everyone loves to watch, so there's no shortage of opinions that are going to move it one way or the other. It's certainly entertaining. It's that's very sure. entertaining. <laughs> and then the second part of it is, and you can see by the subscriber jump, it's very tough to predict how subscribers are going to react to the offers that Netflix is putting out there. So not only do you have kind of the entertainment portion of the stock, but you're also dealing with unproven response models for why consumers subscribe or why they don't. Lucas, you know, what stands out here to you? You know, a couple of things that were also mentioned, you know, a few weeks ago, Reed Hastings says prospects in China don't look good. Uh, today, they announced that they're going to be licensing some of their content to streaming providers in China. How big a deal is that? It could be a very big deal if they, depending on kind of how much they get in return, um, you know, uh, I think investors had already baked into the stock the fact that Netflix probably wasn't going to go there. Uh, so the opportunity to sell to partners is, in a sense, a concession, them saying that they're probably not going to get there anytime soon, if at all. At the same time, I, I think a lot of people have been wondering at what point Netflix would start licensing some of its shows back to other people and whether it works in China could you know, portend some of that elsewhere as well. They're also talking about an increasing amount that they'll be spending on original content, uh, which now accounts for 10 to 20 percent of content costs altogether. That could go up to 50 percent. David, you know, uh, you know, obviously, you know, in many respects, the original content is what has retained subscribers and uh, gotten new subscribers. But, you know, at, at what point does uh, this just get too expensive? Well, if I were an investor, it's already too expensive. I mean, the 300 plus PE, you know, this, the, the problem is in my mind, look, I love Netflix as a company. I think they've done great things. I'm, I'm somebody who sends the money every month, but along with 80 some million other people, but the fact is, it's a really, really good media company that happens to distribute its content over the internet. I don't believe it's a go to the moon company. I think it is a very fortunate company that has grouped itself among the internet community. Therefore, it's perceived to have value alongside companies that really it isn't that much like. How do you respond to that, Greg? The question is going to be how they spend the money. If they just wildly throw money into the market and in a quest to just generate hours.